our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading from chapter 5, verses 27 through 30, today in the NIV translation. This is Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. This week we are finishing the sermon series on the seven deadly sins in the Harper's magazine spoof ads. This is the poster that they came up with for lust. And uh, what it says is we have a, like from a 1920s uh, movie picture, a couple of uh, amorous couple, we'll call them. It says, any sin that's enabled us to survive centuries of war, death, pestilence, and famine cannot be called deadly. And then at the bottom it says, lust. Where would we be without it? That was one of the better ones, I thought. Indeed, where would we be without it? The philosopher Dallas Willard had it right when he says, Intimacy is a spiritual hunger of the human soul, and we cannot escape it. Frederick Gutner wrote, Sex is sinful to the degree that, instead of drawing you closer to other human beings in their humanness, it unites bodies, but, the, but then leaves the lives inside them hungrier and more alone than before. The 17th century philosopher, mathematician, and theologian Blaise Pascal warned that when the passions become masters, they are vices, and they give their nutriment to the soul, and the soul nourishes itself upon it and is poisoned. Oftentimes, we corrupt the beauty of this world by taking the things in it that are good and turning them into bad. Someone once said that a vulture soaring above the air does not see the beautiful landscape below, the brooks, the flowers, the green grass, the trees. It only sees the dead rabbit under the bush because that is what it's looking for. In life, our desires are often about what it is that we seek for ourselves. I'll never forget the prayer of a 17-year-old Augustine, who upon seriously considering becoming a Christian, prayed, Dear Lord, grant me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> Lust is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as a noun meaning a very strong sexual desire, as a verb meaning to have a very strong sexual desire. But see, to the early church fathers, lust was not only sexual, there can be all kinds of lust. We can say something like, I'm just dying for a piece of chocolate, or key lime pie. Our neighbor can roll up in a new SUV, Mercedes, or BMW, same passions rise because we want to be a little like that. See, another definition for lust would be an overpowering compulsive desire or passion. Scripture condemns lust of all kinds and urges believers to show self-control. I was very surprised when I originally did the research for this message to learn that lust was originally in the English language a neutral word. It meant a craving or a strong desire. It could be for anything. 
But in modern English, lust pretty much is restricted to things of a sexual nature. In scripture, lust can mean to desire, to crave, to be greedy, to covet or to be hungry. Actually, it can mean any strong desire that the writer is describing. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. Okay, desire is a good and a God-given thing. But desire misdirected and misused leads to sin. Today we're primarily going to focus on lust in terms of sexual desires. And in many cases, that is something that we battle from our middle teens, possibly through our middle ages. For most people, it often wanes as we get a little older, or so I'm told. I'm not quite there with you yet. Oh, I'm in trouble for that when the SPRC meets this week. <laughs> But if you think about it, seriously, there are many people that don't consider lust a sin. But if you look at the fruits of lust, things like sexual assault, domestic violence, the abuse of children and sex trafficking, all of these are terrible and are among the most severely punished of all the crimes in our land. And they stem from lust. What human hasn't been guilty of lust? Thinking about lust as a vice turns our attention to symptoms that have a deeper source. As we begin looking at lust in Scripture, let's not forget that lust does not have to be acted upon to be considered a sin. The Old Testament has several passages, many passages, that deal with lust. In Job 31, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. In Proverbs 6, it teaches, do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So it is that he who sleeps with another man's wife, no one who touches her will go unpunished. And then of course the most powerful story in the Old Testament on the subject of lust comes from such a sample. One evening, King David got up from his bed and walked around at the roof of the palace. And from the roof, he saw a beautiful young woman bathing. And he sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And so David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him and he slept with her and she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David tries to fix this by bringing Uriah back from the war front. But he's an honorable man. He refuses to sleep with his wife while his fellow soldiers are at risk on the battlefield. And so finally, David, in his exasperation, orders General Joab to send him to the front lines of the war every day until he's killed. The great King David, one of God's most revered servants ever, gives in to lust and it leaves bodies in damage in its carnal lake. Bathsheba loses her husband and a child. Uriah is betrayed to death by a king that he faithfully serves. The general, um, Joab, becomes complicit in the betrayal and thus, therefore, all of David's army as well. And after a visit from the prophet Nathan, his palace servants and his people see that their king is willing to sacrifice his obedient subjects to indulge in his own selfish desires. David shatters his relationship with God 
and moves it aside. The young wrote that David's lust breaks trust, undercuts loyalties, and damages relationships, personal and political, at all levels. The sin in so many of the so-called seven deadly sins is in our perversion of the good. And lust is no different. In the Old Testament book of Solomon, you can read about unabashed, innocent, mutual eroticism of youth as it was intended to be. Sadly, the deadly results of King David's lust is more like the sex is in this modern age today. As we move into the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus, I find it interesting that a lot of people say that Jesus is soft on the subject of lust. And I just, I, I scratch my head, I don't understand that. They cite the fact that he comes down hard on the pious postures, the, the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and all the power brokers of his day, and he treats the prostitutes with compassion and mercy. Indeed, he did not choose to have the woman called an adultery stone as the crowd woman. He didn't tell the woman, as far as we know, he didn't tell the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, who lived with a man that was not her husband, that she must get married. However, we only need to read today's short passage from the Sermon on the Mount, and we know precisely where Jesus stands on this subject. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. As we can see, Jesus condemns not only adultery, but any thoughts that could possibly even lead us to it. He is saying here that we must be vigilant in shunning all avoidable temptation. And we must vigorously resist temptations that are unavoidable. And then Jesus closes out his remarks using hyperbole. Um, that's a fancy word that I learned that means exaggeration. As he says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. If your right arm causes you to stumble, cut it off. Please don't read this as Jesus commending self-mutilation as some people had done. He is exaggerating to emphasize the point, to make sure that his hearers remember this point. And he is saying, do whatever you can, however dramatic, to avoid sin. Because let's face it, even a blind person can lust. Okay, so please don't take some of these teachings in the wrong context. As we look forward into the monastic period, Evagoras wrote, and this is a really good point, he said that demons war with secular people more through objects. But with the monks, they do so especially through thoughts, because monks are deprived of objects because of their solitude. Further, it is to the extent that it is easier to sin in the thought than it is in action. And so the warfare in thought is more difficult than that which is conducted through objects. For the mind is a thing easily set in motion and difficult to check in its tendencies towards unlawful fantasies. Remember that in most of these quotes that I read you from the early monks, they are writing to other monks. These are teaching rules for other monks, people who have taken a vow of chastity for the remainder of their lives. Evagrius taught the young monks to, to avoid lust, that you need to actually flee from any encounters with women. He once wrote this, and ladies, please don't throw anything at me. I'm, I'm quoting Evagrius. He said, the sight of a woman is a poisoned arrow. It wounds the soul and it injects the poison. And for as long a time as it stays there, it causes an even greater festering. That's not a very kind thing to say. 
And one of the desert mothers took objection to it. And so the desert mother, Mama Theodora, countered this teaching to some degree by saying, give the body discipline. And you will see that the body for the and you will see the body is for the one who made it. Even Aquinas, whose prayer we use this morning, admits that lust is a big problem because it is a part of our nature. Thomas Akempis wrote that fire proves proveth iron, and temptation a just man. We may not know oftentimes what we are able to do. But temptation shows us who we are. Temptation shows us who we really are. To which I put in my notes, ouch. He hit that point dead on. Dante said that the seven deadly sins are, are loves perverted, loves attached to the wrong objects for the wrong reasons and in the wrong ways. One of the early desert fathers, Abba Theodore of Fermi in the fourth century said, if, you're, if a friend of yours is tempted by lust, give him a helping hand if you can pull him back. But if he falls into heresy and persists in spite of your efforts, go away quickly and cut off the relationship. For if you dally with him, you might be dragged with him into the deeps. Hugo of St. Victor in the 12th century said, The eye must not fix its gaze on anything that the soul may not desire without sin. The hearing must be pure and governed by discretion, deaf to all things vain and useless, ready to take in with delight the knowledge that is of God, and that our speech must be seasoned with the salt of wisdom, to condemn all that is unprofitable or evil, to give utterance only to what is good and useful. To break the hold that lust has on our hearts, we need to claim the supernatural power and goodness of a loving God who reaches down into the depths and reclaims us. Recalling the brash prayer of the 17-year-old Augustine, Lord, grant me chastity, but not yet. He says, make me holy. Please, God, make me holy. But don't make me give up my favorite indulgence that I have planned for this coming weekend. And you see, later in life, when he finally wanted to give up lustful desire for good, he found he couldn't do it. He said he was imprisoned by chains of habit. And his desire had become a destructive force that he could not exercise through his own willpower. His story shows us that when we find ourselves helpless against the vice, that God has the power to break any chain. Augustine, hopeful and grace-filled testimony is that he, when he found himself failing over and over and over and over again to lust, in his despair because of his own lack of willpower, he heard God asking him the question, why are you relying on yourself only to find yourself unreliable? Well, that quote has been with me all week for a variety of reasons. Why are you relying on yourself only to find yourself unreliable? My friend, St. Augustine's story is timeless. His book's confession is a gift from an ancient service of God of his personal battles with sin given to all the ages that follow him. The letters of the Apostle Paul are also filled with warnings against lush, lust and pleasures of the flesh. In Corinthians, he said, flee from sexual morality. All other, sin, all other sins a person commits is outside of the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Did you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. He told the Galatians, so I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. 
For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of flesh are obvious. He lists sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And finally, he wrote to the Colossians, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, all of which are idolatry. You'll also find that the apostles Peter and John gave warnings against lust in their letters that are in the New Testament. And as we look for ways to overcome lust, we find it's a huge task. Augustine found that it was a huge task. You see, lust colors the eye and the mind and the beholders. We see things as they not really are. And the other thing about lust is, is that it thrives in privacy and isolation. You don't necessarily know that someone is lustful. It's an ancient malady. But one could argue that the technology that we have today enables the sin to be so much worse, so much more prevalent. The internet is particularly well suited for the exercise of and the encouragement of lust, which is, like I said, one of the more secretive of the seven. I recently read somewhere that at least 80% of American teens between the ages of 15 to 17 have had multiple exposures to hardcore pornography. And even if they stop looking, this places powerful images in their minds that are usually perversions of how things are meant to be and how we're meant to be in relationship with others. About lust disordering potential, Frederick Buechner wrote, let me ask you this, does everybody know who Mrs. Mrs. Gundy is? Do you know the phrase? Mrs. Gundy is an old, old phrase for somebody who come from a play. She is the ultimate in piety. And everybody knows it. You can't do anything improper without Mrs. Grundy commenting on it. So Frederick Buechner wrote, contrary to Mrs. Grundy, Sex is not a sin. Contrary to Hugh Hefner, it's not salvation either. Like nitroglycerin, it can be used to either blow up bridges or to heal hearts. Buechner was a powerful writer. For instance, I get ready to start bringing this message to a close. To overcome lust, we need to be fundamentally anchored in love. In love for which no human substitute is ultimately possible. In love with our Creator. In love with our Lord and Savior. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity wrote that what we call being in love is a glorious state and in several ways it's good for us. It helps us to be more generous and courageous. It opens our eyes not only to the beauty of the beloved, but to all of the beauty in its subordinates. Our merely animal sexuality in that sense, love is the great conqueror of lust. I have a quick story I want to share before I close. I don't think I've shared this one with you before. Uh, and you may have heard it. It has to do with Leonardo da Vinci painting The Last Supper. Um, he had worked on this masterpiece and he for a long time was looking for a model to use for Christ. And he looked and he looked and he finally found the choir boy in one of the churches of Rome who had lovely features. The young man's name was um, Pietro Bandinelli. Years passed. The painting still wasn't completed. 
Da Vinci just could not get the face of Judas the way he wanted it. He searched and he searched and he searched. And he finally found a man whose face was hardened and distorted by sin. He was a beggar on the street of Rome. He, he looked so villainous that Da Vinci was afraid of him. Afraid to even approach him. And so he hired the man and he had him sent for Judas. And he painted him on the canvas. And as he got ready to go, he says, oh, wait, sir, I haven't found out your name. And he says, I am P.A. Pietro Bandinelli. I also set for you for your model for Christ. And that story always brings up the question, in whose place would we be sitting today? Judas' seat or in Jesus' seat. The path that we choose to travel in life determines where we're going to end up. St. Augustine said our hearts are created to be restless until they find rest in the proper object of their love. Again, as with some of the other seven, the sin of lust is not in the desire, but rather in having an improper false object of our desire. Christianity is not about extinguishing desire, but rather about training and hungering and thirsting after the one who has created us for communion with God's own self. In your relationships, the young said with others and with God, she said, if your relationship with others and with God adequately feed your need to love and to be loved, you will see through and you will despise what lust has to offer. And again, I'll close with Augustine's famous quote. You have made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Indeed, our hearts will never be at rest, will never be at peace until we focus them on the God who created us for the purpose of being in relationship with him.